Hello my friends, Hank here, and welcome back to Sherman School, where we're learning all about the legendary M4 medium tank, and specifically, some of the key visual clues that we can observe to identify the nearly two dozen variants of this iconic vehicle. Now, in our last class, we wrapped up the discussion of the various designs of the Sherman's hull in the heats system for identifying Sherman tanks. If you missed it, you can pop back over and check it out right now. But today we're shifting gears and talking about the main reason that the M4 ended up with so many sub-designations, a la the M4, the M4A1, the M4A2, the M4A3, and of course, the M4A4. And that, of course, would be the vehicle's power plant. Yes, all of those variants, except for two, have different engines, believe it or not. Now, why is a single tank using a whole bunch of different engines? Well, we're gonna find out today. You might be thinking, the engine is inside the tank though, last time I checked. We can't exactly see that in most pictures. And you know what? You're right. But these different power plants led to some design changes that are visible on the outside of the hull as well, and that's what we're going to keep our eyes out for. First though, let's learn about the muscle behind the Sherman. Let's dive in. Sherman School Part 3, Engines. Now before we get into it here, I will be referencing my Sherman Spotters Guide and Sherman Data Sheet posters a bit in this video. If you'd like to pick one of these up for your own reference, you can over at spruceandbruce.com or down in the shop below this video. It's not necessary, but if you'd like to grab one, you can. All right, so as we learned in a previous episode, life for the Sherman begins with the Cast Hall M4A1 in February of 1942. And those earliest Shermans are designed around the Continental R975 radial engine. The R975 is a nine-cylinder air-cooled radial piston engine originally designed to power aircraft. These were first designed and built by Curtis Wright, and many, many, many of these have been built by the time the Second World War begins. After the war starts, and now there's this tremendous need for new armored vehicles on a very fast timetable, the folks in charge of U.S. procurement for the military end up designing a new tank around this existing tried-and-true power plant. And this becomes the Sherman. Now, the R975 is an aircraft engine, of course, and on aircraft, interior size constraints, not really much of an issue. But with a tank, you've got to fit this whole thing inside an armored hull. The reason the Sherman is so tall and has such a tall silhouette is because of this R975 engine. Designers built the vehicle around this radial engine and had to account for the drive shaft resting pretty high in the fighting compartment, hence the extra total height of the vehicle. The Continental Company is going to be in charge of licensed production of this Curtis Wright design for all armored vehicles during the war, and by the time all is said and done, they build over 50,000 of these guys. Now, the Cast Hall M4A1 is the initial production of the Sherman, and it will utilize this R975 radial engine. The Welded Hall M4, as we learned, is initially produced to help relieve production bottlenecks around the large single-piece cast hull of the M4A1. Other than the hull design, the M4 and the M4A1 are basically mechanically identical. Both are going to be powered by the Continental R975. Now, this is all fine and dandy, but then the folks overseeing military production realize, hmm, we're not only going to need a ton of tanks, but we're also going to need a ton of aircraft. And a decent sum of these R975s and the components that are used to make them are going to need to go towards aircraft production. So designers start looking for new power plants for the Sherman tank. It's a tried and true design, so let's see if we can just pop a new engine in there, right? The first effort to swap out the power plant will come from the folks over at General Motors. They figure out how to basically mate two of their six-cylinder inline diesel truck engines around a single torque converter and provide enough juice to power this tank. And it turns out this GM6406 diesel works pretty damn well. Initial field tests reveal that the Sherman actually performs a bit better with this new GM engine, which is great. These new Shermans start rolling off the production lines in the spring of 1942 and are christened the M4A2. The only problem, however, is that it's a diesel power plant. Now, at this point in time, the U.S. Army pretty much exclusively operates their equipment with standard gasoline engines, and they don't want to add a whole new supply and logistical network just for one vehicle that runs on diesel. So, almost immediately, as you might expect, the Army is out on the new M4A2. You know who is interested, though? The U.S. Marine Corps. The Marines and the Navy do use diesel for many of their smaller vessels, and they are on board. No pun intended. The M4A2 ends up only seeing American service with the Marines over in the Pacific. They do, however, also find many homes in Europe through the Lend-Lease program. The Commonwealth armies aren't bothered by the diesel power plant, and neither are the Soviets, go figure. The beast that is the Russian T-34 is built around a diesel V-12 already, so no problem logistically here. So at this point, back in the States, 
We're still making radial engine M4s and M4A1s, and we're making M4A2s for Lend-Lease distribution and for the Marine Corps, but we still haven't solved that supply problem around the gasoline power plant. Now, in the summer of 1942, the folks over at Ford come up with a solution. They've got a lovely little gasoline-powered V8 engine that will fit in the Sherman's engine bay with plenty of room to spare. And so, just like that, the M4A3 is born. This alleviates the Army's supply line problem for fueling the vehicle, but they're still a little hesitant to introduce a new slew of parts for maintenance and repairs in the field around this V8 instead of around the radial engine. Their hand is more or less played for them, however, after the armor losses in the Normandy breakout campaign, and especially during the Battle of the Bulge, end up necessitating the need for these new M4A3s to be fielded as rapidly as possible to make up for lost tanks. So by the winter of 44-45, we're going to start seeing some M4A3s supplementing and eventually overtaking the number of M4s and M4A1s fielded in the ETO. Now, there was one other major attempt to replace the Sherman's power plant, and that came from the folks at Chrysler, also in the summer of 1942. Now, we know the engine bay of the Sherman is big, right, to fit the original Continental Radial in there. The Chrysler team took advantage of this and thought, why don't we just jam five six-cylinder truck engines in there and see what happens? I'm joking a little bit, of course, but that is essentially what they did. The Chrysler A57 Multibank is five of their existing flathead six-cylinder gasoline engines mated around a single crankcase. The thing is absolutely enormous, as you might guess, but they did find a way to plop it in a Sherman tank, formally creating the M4A4. Only one small problem here. The Sherman in its current layout wasn't long enough to fit the new Multibank engine, so designers lengthened the hull of the M4A4 by nearly a foot, spaced out the bogies a little bit, and slapped a few extra track links on there. Boom. Problem solved. Well, as you might expect, if the U.S. Army was initially hesitant to accept the new V8 power plant due to the change in logistics and spare parts, you better believe that they were not interested in this monstrosity. The Army said no, right off the bat. The Marines said no, as they already had their diesel vehicles, and were also starting to like the M4A3s, but the British said, sure. Turns out they really liked the M4A4, and all of the nearly 7,500 units produced ended up being shipped over as Lend-Lease vehicles. So, we just covered the four main power plants utilized in production of the Sherman tank throughout the course of World War II. To recap, the M4 and the M4A1 both feature the Continental R975 radial engine. This also includes the M4 composite hulls, of course. The M4A2 uses the General Motors 6406 diesel engine. The M4A3 uses the Ford GAA V8 gasoline-powered engine. And finally, the M4A4 uses the big ol' Chrysler A57 multibank. Now, as mentioned, these different engines mounted within the Sherman do result in some external differences as well, though at this point in the video I've been ranting for quite a while here, so we'll call it on this video, and in our next lesson we're going to dive into those external differences that you can actually look for in your reference imagery. So stay tuned my friends, and until next time, be well, happy building, cheers.